Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense and his clear, open heart. In order to continue presenting these podcasts, we need your support. Please go to mindpodnetwork.com slash jack and you can donate there or you can go through our Amazon or Audible affiliate links. And that's another great way to support the podcast. Thank you for your generous attention. And there are all these different things that draw us to a spiritual life or practice. But when you get right down to it, they also bring us back to one of the great questions, which is, who am I? What am I supposed to do here? What am I doing as a human being? Who am I or what am I? Is another way to ask it. Hmm. And I was talking to some of these neuroscientists who are friends, Richie Davidson, Cliff, Saren, and others, said the thing I'd really like you to study is the question of identity. How is it that we take our particular point of view, our tribe, our small group, or whatever, and say, this is me, all the Republicans, or all the Democrats, or the Libertarians, or the, you know, the whatever you identify with, the golfers, right? <laughs> or the feminists, or the whatever it is, you know. Um, and how do we step beyond that small sense of self? In India, it's said that when a baby is born, the song in the womb of the baby is, do not let me forget who I am. And then the song changes after the baby's born, oh dear, I'm forgetting already. You know, and in Bali, where I lived for quite a while and different longer periods with my family and my daughter when she was little and studying Balinese dance and all these great things. Anyway, in Bali, they say that people who are closest to the gods are young people and old ones who are returning back to, you know, and the ones who are farthest from the gods are middle aged people with mortgages, basically. <laughs> To forget who you really are, right? <laughs> so one of the best books I've read in the last few years, and I read pieces from it, is Greg, Father Greg Boyle's book, Tattoos on the Heart. He works with uh, Homeboy Industries in L.A. and with these gang kids. And so here's an account. He tells all these stories. And he said, I'm working with these kids in this tough, you know, Gang kid comes in, his walk is chingon, high gear, head bobbed side to side. He's like, you know, I'm tough man. Sits down with a skull. And I just look at him and I say, what's your name? Sniper, he sneers. <laughs> you know, sniper. <laughs> okay, look, I'd been down this block before. I have a feeling you didn't pop out of your mom and she took one look at your ass and said, sniper, so come on dog, what's your name? <laughs> Gonzalez, he resent, relents a little. Okay, now, son, I know the staff here call you by your last name. I'm not down with that. Tell me, mijo, what's your mom call you? <laughs> Cabron. There's even the slightest flicker of innocence in his answer. Oye, no cabe duda. But, son, I'm looking for birth certificate. Not looking for birth certificate here. The kid softens. I can tell it's happening, but there's embarrassment and a newfound vul vulnerability. Napoleon, he manages to squeak out, pronouncing it in Spanish. Wow, I say, that's a fine, noble, historic name. But I'm almost positive that when your Jafita calls you, she doesn't use the whole nine yardas. Come on, mijito, do you have an apado? What's your mom call you? And then I watch him go to some far distant place, a location he's not visited in some time. His voice, body language, and whole being are taking a new shape right before my eyes. Sometimes his voice so quiet I lean in. Sometimes when my mom's not mad at me, she calls me Napito. And I watch this kid move, transform from sniper to Gonzales to Cabron to Napoleon to Napito. We all just want to be called by the name our mom uses when she's not pissed off at us. <laughs> And so we put on all these, all these 
garments of identity. And yet, as I say so often, when you stand and look in the mirror and you notice that you've aged a bit, right? Come on, you have, right? And yeah, it's so weird. It droops and sags and loses its fur and does all these things. But anyway, um, but the weird thing is always is that you don't necessarily feel older. You know that the feeling? And that's because it's only your body that's aged. And even looking in the mirror for a moment, there's some part of you that realizes that your body, you just rent it. It's not who you are. I mean, you get it from Avis or something like that. Hurts, right? You have it for a while, but there's a spirit that's the witness of that, which is consciousness itself, which is this loving awareness that is who you are. And that consciousness was born when you, you know, came into the womb, and born with you as a child, innocent and pure and inviolable, um, untainted. And it looks at you in the mirror and says, wow, huh, getting a little older there. How's the incarnation going? You know, really. Um, because it knows that that's not who you are. That's temporary in some deep way. And it's so amazing to have a human incarnation with the little bits of fur and wiggly things. And as I like to say, the hole at one end into which you stuff dead plants and animals regularly and grind them up and, you know, glug them down the tube and all that. It's strange, isn't it? Huh? You, you, and if you don't think that's strange, pay attention next time you're making love. It's a fabulous thing to do, but it's weird. It is, and it's how we make new people. Come on. You know, that's where you came from. A little squirt here, a little whatever, egg, a new person. Come on, it's insane. It is, isn't it? Okay, so here you are. You got a human incarnation. Now the practices here, the practices of mindfulness of the breath and body, of mindfulness of thoughts and feelings, the practices of loving awareness, of compassion and loving kindness, um, what they do, yes, you learn how to calm yourself or release some of the tightness and stress, find some graciousness, but most fundamentally what they do is they invite a profound shift of identity from the body of fear, it's called, that small sense of self, and all the history and trauma that you have, which is genuine, your unworthiness, how many people feel unworthy? Don't bother. Don't raise your hand. Because you know? it's ubiquitous here. You know, and people, all the stories that you have about who you are, it's like that cartoon from Jules Pfeiffer where he, in a few little squares, is this man sitting there, sort of reflective, with a reflective look on his face saying, I inherited my father's... Uh, way of thinking and his attitude about things. Next little thing. I inherited his way of dressing and his style. I inherited my father's uh, artistic ability and his um, drive and ambition. And then, and I inherited my mother's contempt for my father. You know? <laughs> and there it is, you know. So you could say, all right, this is who I am, your parents, your family, and so forth. Um, but the Buddhist texts begin with this phrase, O nobly born, O you who are the sons and daughters of the awakened one, do not forget who you really are. Do not forget that spirit of freedom, the loving awareness that's looking in the mirror and saying, wow, look at this, here we are in the middle of this incarnation, really interesting time. What Thomas Merton called the secret beauty of your heart, the nobility. Um, and I love the story of Ramdas um, coming back from being with his guru in India years ago, author of Be Here Now. And he'd gone to India as this Harvard professor and met this guru who was quite an amazing being from every, all the friends I had who were with him. Um, 
And he said, the, the, this guru looked at me with, in India, they call it the glance of mercy, with so much love. He said, I, I could hardly fathom it. And yet he could read my mind. He knew everything I was thinking, and he still loved me. <laughs> you know, that now there's something, right? <laughs> and um, after a year or two or whatever, he kind of urged Ramdas to go back to America and begin to teach, as he did, and became quite famous in the 60s and 70s. And Ramdas said, I'm not ready. I'm too impure. I have a lot more inner work to do. I'm too neurotic and, and so forth. And his guru got up from the bench where he was sitting, peered at Ramdas very closely, and then walked around him really slowly, kind of looking him up and down, took about five minutes, kind of looking at all different parts of him, and then sat back down, smiled and said, I see no imperfections. It's such an amazing thing to say to a human being, to see that beauty that was born in you and that can't be lost. And you can forget it at times, but it's there. It's that human spirit. So the invitation of meditation, yes, again, calming insights, understanding comes, but also it's a shift of identity where you can hold yourself more lightly. You know what it's like to lie out on the grass and look up into the Milky Way, right? I like to do it and pretend, actually, that I'm on the bottom of the planet, held on by the magnet of gravity, right? And I'm looking down into space. You know, it's really wild, because you are, actually. There's no, you know, whoa, look down there, right? But, you know, or you go way up in the mountains, you know, whether it's the Milky Way or the high mountains or something, and you get a big perspective. And here we are, the ant people worried about all these things and so forth. And you're part of something so huge and magnificent. Now, it doesn't mean that the meditation invites a kind of spiritual bypass or end run on your humanity. You also sit and you get the ocean of tears and your grief and loneliness and the pains of your body. And you have to learn how to bring a loving awareness and a fearless presence to, you know, the measure of sorrows you have. My teacher Ajahn Sa said, if you haven't really wept deep, deeply, you probably haven't been meditating for very long. You know, so that's part of it. And um, or the poet Hafiz who says, you know, do not abandon, don't surrender your loneliness so quickly. Let it cut more deeply, let it ferment and season you like few human ingredients can. So you see it, and instead of opening the refrigerator, you know, when you're lonely or bored or going online or calling somebody, you sit with your human condition, with the trauma you carry and the longing and the loneliness and the grief and the pains, and you honor it as we did tonight, as if you name it and honor it with a bow not as a bypass, and yet, as you do, as the mind quiets and the heart softens, you also discover that it's not who you really are. That identity is, you know, it's quite tentative. Sakaya Ditti, it's called in the Buddhist psychology, this capacity of consciousness to create a little box or a wall and say, this is who I am and this is not who I am, right? And so my body or my family or my tribe or my gender or my nation or my orientation or my job or my age, I'm an old person or a young person or, you know, a military person or a peaceful, you know, somebody who works for peace. I saw this cartoon in the New Yorker that shows two generals striding down the hall of the Pentagon with all their medals, one says to the other. It really scared me, you know. I dreamed the meek inherited the earth. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, we have our identities. But if you are, if you're a cop, let's say you're a cop, you're a police, policewoman or policeman, and I remember being on this radio show, Michael Krasny, one time doing call-in in San Francisco. And I get a call from this guy, and he says, um, 
hi, you know, Jack, I'm a, I'm a beat cop in San Francisco. I walk the streets and, you know, I try not to be violent. I'm really a Buddhist practitioner, but I carry a gun. Is it okay to carry a gun and be a Buddhist? And I said, I hope so. You know, I'd like a lot more like you. He said, I really don't want to be violent and I try to minimize, you know, I try to help people, whatever. But here you are. If you're the cop and you go home and you can't take your badge and your gun off and just be dad or mom or husband or wife or whatever it is in your family and you insist on keeping that role, your family ain't going to be very healthy or last very long. It won't because it's just a role. Um, and so we have all these different identities. Um, there was this study, I talked about it some weeks ago, that was done, a group of students, you know, it's, that's of course who they study, right, at some university or other, was invited to take a, a difficult math test. And the women who were invited, it was a group of women who were also Asian American women, okay, and they were going to take this difficult math test. And just before they sat down to take the test, half of the group, a little line was dropped and we're really glad that you're going to take this test. Um, and uh, of course you know that um, people from Asia or Asian American and so forth do very well in math, so enjoy the test, right? <laughs> Next half the group sits down and says, we're really glad you're going to take this test. We know math is a little hard for women, but we hope we wish you well. Okay, same Asian American women. The ones who, who heard the it's hard for women and identified as being a woman, their scores were 25% lower than the same group who identified with being Asian. What you think of yourself starts to make the way your life unfolds. You understand that, Julia Childs, because in our country, it's like after 9-11, our president said the best antidote to 9-11 is to go shopping, right? Remember that? <laughs> That's our national response, okay? <laughs> Julia Childs writes, in department stores, so much unnecessary kitchen equipment is bought indiscriminately by people who had just come in for men's underwear. <laughs> And we're consumers, and we're taught to be. So that's who you are. You are a consumer. The more you have, the better, right? Well, okay, that's an identity. But who are you really? Who are you? What does it mean to step back from the different roles you play, which are, you want to play beautifully. You want to be a teacher. You want to be a student. You want to be a lover. You want to be a caretaker for nature. You want to, you know, all the beautiful things you can do for a human being, but you want to hold them lightly. And then you say, well, in my family, you know, I mean, I love the story that I tell from Ramdas, where somebody asked him, you know, Ramdas, here you are teaching all these Hindu things about, you know, chanting to Ram and Sita and Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita and stuff, but weren't you born Jewish? I mean, what about your Jewish heritage? And, he was bar mitzvahed as I was, you know, and had this Jewish upbringing. And he said, you know, that's beautiful. He said, there's lots of great stuff in the Jewish tradition, as in all the great spiritual traditions. And there's the Hasidic teachings and mystical teachings, and there's the Kabbalah and so forth. He said, but remember, I'm only Jewish on my parents' side. <laughs> And it's a, it's a very, you know, he was quite witty before his stroke. He had this great gift. But also there's something quite profound in it. Because who you are is not limited by your parents. And it's not limited by your childhood. And it's not limited by your body. And so the invitation is to remember who you really are. The innate compassion you know, and not to get too proud about it or something, this is a study from the University of Chicago where they sought to find out whether a rat would release a fellow rat from this really constricted enclosure. So there was a, a rat in a big cage and, you know, doing okay as cages go. And then there was a rat in this really uncomfortable tight part right next to the cage. And the rat in the big cage, there was a lever that it could push without any reward, it was poking around, and then it would release the other rat. 
and it learned to do it. And then when they'd put rats that were stuck in there and would squeak, it would go over and release them. Because it didn't, it, whatever reason, it thought it should, you know, it should release them, they should be free. And they would give the free, the rat that was free roaming in the cage, uh, chocolate chips. <laughs> I mean, where's my cookie, my chocolate chip cookie? Anyway, they'd give it chocolate chips. And not only would the rat release the other rat, but most rats, you know, they'd give it five chocolate chips, and it would save one or two chocolate chips <laughs> for the rat that it released. So, I mean, I know you're compassionate, but, you know, don't take it like too, you know, <laughs> build it up too big, right? <laughs> My teacher, Ajahn Chah, who was this wonderful forest monk and master, um, very loving and wise, he practiced in a quite ascetic tradition. We were in a in the tradition of forest wanderers, um, and so we lived very, very simply. And he lived in caves and out in the forest where there were tigers and wild animals and things like that for a number of years, and learned the kind of forest um, medicine and all those things that one learned back in those days when there were still the great forests in Thailand and Laos. A lot of them have been cut down, but they were there when I went 40 some years ago. And um, after traveling and training and having all these insights and learning all these things and meditative samadhi experiences and jhana and so forth, he went and found the greatest meditation master of the time, this other Ajahn named Ajahn Man. And he went and he told him about all the training that he'd been doing and all the experiences that he'd had, and the lights and visions and insights and great openings. And Ajahn Man listened and didn't say anything for a while and said, well, that's nice, but you've missed the point. He said, those are just experiences. And the real point is to ask, to whom do they happen? Who are you? Who is the witness to these experiences? Because experiences are like going to the movies, romantic comedy and war movie and tragedy movie and, you know, um, documentary and all these kinds of movies. And then they're gone. But who is it that witnesses? Who are you? And then Ajahn Man instructed Ajahn Chah, my teacher, to turn his attention back to the witnessing, what I was calling loving awareness tonight. And Ajahn Chah's phrase was to be the one who knows, to be the knowing. And to rest in the awareness that sees thoughts and feelings, pleasure and pain, gain and loss come and go. To rest in your Buddha nature, which is spacious and timeless and open and filled with a kind of natural connection because it's not this small sense of self, not the body of fear. And then you can honor your incarnation, but you know how it is. You're in conflict, you're in difficulty, and then you take a walk, you take a deep breath. <sighs> you do a few moments of your mindfulness meditation. You bring in loving kindness, and all of a sudden that contraction and that struggle and so forth starts to soften and open. You say, oh yeah, here we are, conflict. Humans have conflict. She wants that and he wants that. And you know, we have differences and we work them out in some way or other, you know. And the, that bigger perspective opens. And as you practice, and it's why we practice, not to have some state or some experience, you come more and more to trust the capacity to release the grasping of some particular identity. I'm a liberal or a conservative or a feminist or a whatever it happens to be. All of, you know, which might be fine identities, but please hold them lightly. The Buddha said, those who cling to their views and opinions not only suffer, but they go around the world annoying other people. <laughs> you know it's true, don't you? Right? And so there's a way of releasing them 
And as you do, what begins to blossom quite naturally is a sense of calm and ease, not because the thoughts stop. They can stop sometimes, but then they start up again. The mind secretes thoughts like the salivary gland secretes saliva. It just does, you know, the ocean of pictures and words. You just notice it like a river, you know, and if you hold on, then you get rope burn because it keeps changing. And the perceptions keep changing and the body changes and so forth. And the point isn't to stop change because you are a river, but to become the space of awareness that allows the river and holds it with some compassion and graciousness and lightness and ease, which grows. And then the qualities of the Buddha of integrity and truthfulness, clarity, patience grow, because you're not trying to be something. You're inhabiting what you've been given and doing beautiful, whatever you can do with it, but you're not holding on so tightly. And that's really what liberation is about. It's not about being somebody different. I mean, you're weird and you can't help it, right? <laughs> it's not about being somebody different. It's a, We're all weird, that's right. It's about letting go and saying, oh, this is the way things are in the human realm. Now let me love anyway, even though there are bombs, you know, even though there's tragedy and loss. Let me love anyway, even though there's beautiful things. Some of them are tended and some of them are ignored. And I said the other day, um, I was talking about Wes Nisker, who teaches here, my good friend, who went up to interview Gary Snyder this winter for the Inquiring Mind, or news journal and talk to Gary who's now in his mid 80s and Pulitzer Prize winning poet and you know amazing ecological visionary environmentalist from the 1950s and 60s one of our great environmental heroes said all right Gary he said you know you look at the world now 50 60 years later from when you started and there's been deforestation and global warming and loss of species and all these great climate change problems. And um, what advice do you have to us at this time? And he said, don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty is his advice. He said, if you feel guilty, that's not gonna work. He said, save it because you love it. Not out of guilt. Guilt, you'll just get in some fight and make it worse. He said, if you wanna save it, do it just because it's beautiful and you love it. It's like your lover and you take care of her, the earth. You understand? So you act, but you act in a different way with graciousness, without the clinging as much, without holding your view and the way it's supposed to be and who you are and your people and those people and so forth. You act out of love. And there grows then this beautiful sense of trust You live more in the reality of the present, which is the invitation of mindfulness. Fact is, there's only the present. All the rest of it is just living in your head, quite honestly, because the future is just thoughts, right? Where is it? In the past, memory. might be a good memory, but it's just a memory. The only thing that's really alive, where you can love a person or see them deeply or care for them or the earth, is now. In fact, that's all there is, is now. So you let go and you say, all right, I'll live this human life with resting in loving awareness, being the conscious witness of it all. Not in a detached way, but actually in a way that's more deeply connected. And this beautiful trust grows as you live in the present. What grows is the capacity not to be so lost in the past or not so frightened of the future but instead to plant seeds that are beautiful and to trust that somehow the earth wants you here. I mean, obviously life approves of you or you wouldn't still be here, right? You are approved of, how's that? 